Welcome everyone to the January 18th Mount Byron Public Board meeting. Uh, sorry we were a little bit late, but um, we look forward to a packed agenda tonight. And why don't we start by uh, saying the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so can I get a motion first to adopt tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay, so next we go to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Um, let's see. Oh, wait, I forgot to hold on. Any comments yes. from the public tonight on any items not on tonight's agenda? Okay, hearing none. Now we'll go to the consent agenda. Sorry. Personnel item six, special services item seven, and then um, the consent agenda for business item eight. To get a motion. So, uh, <laughs> motion. Second. Second. All in favor? All right. So um, just to note on tonight's consent agenda, we did a few important things. First off, appointed Peggy McInerney as Coleman Hill principal. <laughs> and then appointed Colleen O'Connor as assistant director of special services. Sadly, we also have a number of teachers um, who are very talented and staff uh, who are very talented who are retiring, and we, we also uh, did that too on the consent agenda. So. And, they, and they all came to Byram after me pretty much, which is crazy. Oh. But Deb DeFrancesco, Ken Kaplan, Amy Passman, Mary Stout, and Jackie White. And there isn't um, a teacher on here who is not going to be sorely missed. Yeah. Right? And we're going to celebrate them in the, wow. in the spring, yeah. for sure. I mean, and, and I remember one of the teachers, for example, um, I said to Tim, I could say I could say who it is, who cares? Mary Stout. <laughs> um, I said, oh, I'm going to be talking to Mary Stout. And he said, oh, God, I hope she's not retiring. That's going to be a terrible loss to the classroom, right? And the, I think that's just how we feel about all the retirees yeah. on here. Yeah. So. It's really exciting for them and really bittersweet for us. Yeah, well time. said. Yeah. And if I, if you don't mind, if I say something of about our, our two administrators here tonight, um, Peggy, yeah. this, uh, how many positions, Peggy, have you had in Byron Hills? <laughs> <laughs> well, this one's kind of the same, right? But it is, <laughs> it is, but eight. I mean, I did move in the same house between apartments a few times. So I feel like it was definitely a move, right? So this is eight. So uh, Peggy has done everything from assistant principal to principal to assistant to the superintendent to principal again at a time that we really needed it and now going to Coleman Hill to really support our curriculum and our students in the K2 and um, you're like a versa incredibly versatile human being Peggy and parents, kids, teachers, everybody's so happy that you're going to be doing that and going to Coleman Hill. And I feel that you have really set up the leadership at Wampus to be very successful and can't thank you enough for just your flexibility in this district and doing what the district needs. So from, from my heart, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And as a parent who's losing you, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, it's not the same. same You're right. <laughs> And to Colleen, um, we were so excited to get you to come over to Byram Hills as an assistant principal from a neighboring school, and who would have ever thought that you would have taken us up on that offer? And um, it, it was immediately apparent to all of us that you understood the Byram Hills way of working, which is that you work as hard and as long as you need to to get a most excellent job done. Um, and that you do that in, in the power of others, right? And with the power of others. So I know that when we look at positions, whether they're teacher positions or administrative positions, we have a great succession plan in Byram Hills, but it does not mean that somebody who is ready and certified for a position gets it. And we've seen that in our district. Um, so for you to have come out heads above your peers in this process um, and really just showing to a committee how amazing you are for special education, pulling that background that you had prior to your assistant principal years and continuing that work as an assistant principal right now. I, I can't imagine anybody taking that position over other than you. So congrats to you, you're gonna be fantastic. And thanks to both of you for just, for being Byram Hills, right? That's what this is about. It's about liking what you're doing and liking who you're doing it with. And the work is really, really tough sometimes, uh, but we do have each other, right? So thanks for 
giving that of yourselves to all the people here. Including, especially me, thanks. That's <laughs> That's <a bunch. laughs> all right. Awesome. So we go on to special report, budget hearing number one. That time of year again. That's right, the middle of the evening. <laughs> Thank you and welcome to the first budget presentation uh, of the year. Turn it over to Lori to talk a little bit about the schedule development, uh, budget development process. So the, on the screen right now is the budget calendar, and this is obviously our first budget hearing on January 18th. Only at the second and the third budget hearing is there allowed to be public comments. So please mark your calendars, March 22nd and March 29th. You can have public comments. April 5th is the fourth budget hearing. April 19th is the budget adoption. May 3rd will be the fifth budget hearing. And May 17th at Pritigan will be the budget vote. So developing the budget, um, there's guidelines that we, we set forth and we preserve. Uh, really just follow an approach of uh, taking into account the enrollment projections, our board goals, keeping the quality educational programs in our facilities that we currently have review our staffing needs, uh, make sure we're in compliance, uh, and use, use historical revenues and expenditures to develop the budget going forward. And again, keeping in mind our facilities and, and improving our facilities and keeping that maintenance on a year-to-year -year basis. And I think that maintenance for our district, uh, it's about maintenance and it's also about looking ahead. And the fact that Byron Hills, you know, something that was created by my predecessors, looked at the maintenance of our buildings and our district and put that into the budget every year so that we weren't um, in a position where suddenly we need to go out and have bonds to pay for things like roof repairs and boilers and everything else um, that we do see some other districts struggle with right now. Um, that's a nod to my predecessors who put that into place and it's continuing to serve us well in these budgets. Absolutely. And uh, the board has a, a copy of the five-year fiscal trend analysis. It really just reviews the historical expenditures and revenues um, based on various assumptions. It uh, takes into account enrollment projections, um, salary and benefits. It takes into account the consumer price index, which changes on, on a yearly basis. In terms of enrollment, this information is based on a demographer's report from November. Um, as you can see, uh, into uh, next year, we're projecting a, a slight increase um, in our total population. Um, then again, increasing the next two years and kind of leveling out for the next three years going forward. Please keep in mind, you know, this is pushing out uh, far into the future and that information obviously can change um, depending on a year to year basis and the area. And later I'm going to have the demographer's report which is going to not only show the numbers that we're currently experiencing, um, the additional sections that we had to add to kindergarten this year, but also the number of properties that are being developed and the potential impact that that's going to have on our school population also. Is the demographer's report from this year? Yes. Or yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Updated every year. That's Got great. It. And here's just a breakdown by building. You'll see uh, Coleman Hill, for example, having a, a slight increase. Uh, Wampus having a large increase uh, into next year projected. Decrease at HCC and then uh, a slight decrease uh, over at the high school. Um, and again, just projecting out based on that information out to 26-27. This is an analysis of our debt service, uh, the current year, uh, 21 22. Last year, we, uh, one of our bonds expired. We paid off the final debt service payment uh, last year on one of our bonds. Uh, so you can see that significant decrease um, going into the 2021 school year. Uh, we were able to refinance our remaining bonds, uh, and we saw a nice savings of about $308,000. Our final remaining bond, as you can see, as the payments go forward, the interest rate starts, the interest payment starts to decrease. You're paying off just the principal. Um, so we get to 26, 27 school year, we no longer have a, a bond payment. We finally paid off that bond. Uh, we don't anticipate any projects at this point uh, that would require um, borrowing after 25, 26. This is Jen's slide. Um, just, uh, uh, it's a very busy, I'll just kind of explain it here. On the left here is your total percentage of expenditures. On your right is, is the dollar amount. Um, this white line represents the budget. The white ones are our previous budget. Green is our current year. And, oh, Purple is uh, projected based on the five-year fiscal trend. This red uh, section of the bar is, is salaries, and the blue is benefits. So as you can see, 
In terms of salary and benefits, in most school districts, it's between 70 and 80% of your total budget. Any school district, that's the majority of your, your expenses are, are staffing. Um, as you can see, we want to be around the 75% line in terms of salary and benefits. We've been a little higher uh, in the past couple of years. But keep in mind, it's a percentage of the budget. You know, we did decrease our debt service you know, over $2.5 million, $2 million, so that percentage of salary and health is going to be more of that pot when you decrease that large amount of debt service. So we're around that range of 75, which is where you want to be. Again, these are projections just based on, on, a, on a formula going forward, uh, just to kind of take a look and give us a blueprint going forward of, of that information. Uh, this is basically our, our, our fiscal trend going forward. As you can see, uh, the past couple of years, we, we've had a, about a surplus of a little over 2%. Um, you, ideally, you want to be around in that range, about 2% or less. Uh, I anticipate this year we may be a little less than the 2% based on how it's going so far. Um, but ideally, uh, projecting out, you want to have a, a range of uh, between uh, 1% and 2% uh, budget remaining at the end of the school year. The true uh, value tax rate, uh, this is last year's information. The current, this year's current information is not available yet. should be by the next meeting. I should have it. Um, essentially, what a true tax rate is, you lift up your house, you put it in another district. How does that compare with other districts in Westchester? And Byron Hills is actually a, a very good comparative space. Um, out of 46 districts, um, uh, we're, uh, we rank number 39. So this is a, this is a category where you want to be towards the end. Uh, number one would be the highest true tax rate, meaning you put it in the district. Another, your house in that district, you'd be paying the most taxes. Um, so again, we're at 39 out of 46, so there's 38 districts that have a higher tax value than us, and only seven with lower. Okay, in terms of the property tax and the formula, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of go through that quickly, how that's calculated. I think it's important to understand those factors going forward. Um, quick history on the per property tax cap, it was developed in the 12-13 school year. Uh, it was actually signed into permanent law in 2018. So. Here's the actual formula if you want to look back and try to take a look of, of how it's calculated and you know, uh, try to work out that, uh, that, uh, that math. I'm attempting to break it down tonight for you just to kind of give you a little more information. But I wanted to make sure we're talking the same language. You, see, you hear a lot of information about the tax cap, the 2% tax lab, cap, maximum tax levy, maximum allowable. So I want to just kind of you know, understand those, those, kind of, those, uh, those categories. So the tax levy is essentially just a formula base uh, without exclusions. And I'll explain that when we get to the formula. The second is the maximum allowable tax rate. This is the most any school district could tax um, their public based on the formula. And the final is proposed. So there's a maximum amount you could actually um, tax the public, and there's something, there's a, the number that you propose um, when you do the budget vote. You know, for example, we've never gotten to the maximum allowable tax levy. Every year we've done below the tax levy and proposed an amount below the maximum allowable tax levy. Okay, so quickly on the formula. So it's a, an attempt to simplify it. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a, a calculation in the process, but essentially the first part of the formula is you take your, your current year uh, tax levy, right here was about $84.5 million, and you multiply that by a tax based growth factor. Tax based growth factor is uh, completed by the Department of Taxation up in New York State. Essentially, what it is, it's changes in assessed value in your town on a year to year basis. So maybe you there's new construction in, in your town, you see an increase in assessed value. Maybe you see a reduction, maybe some businesses leave, you'll see a, a reduction in your assessed value. That's calculated and it's, it's put into what the, a tax-based growth factor. So it's an increase, basically, of your assessed value on a year-to-year -year basis. This year, it's about a half a percent, um, 0.49. Um, the last two years, we've seen rather large growth factors. Uh, keep in mind that 2021 school year, and if you're a member, other board members may, um, the Swiss Re pilot came off. Uh, we, get, we had a pilot with Swiss Re that came off back onto the assessed value of the tax roll. So we saw, we saw a large growth factor that year, almost 2%. Um, last year we had almost 1%, and this year it's kind of leveled off to where it probably will be going forward at about a half a percent. Our pilots, we have two remaining pilots. Uh, like I said, uh, Swiss Re came off a couple of years ago. We have IBM and Engel Berman. Um, our current year pilot is about $2.5 million. Next, next year it's projected uh, to be $2.4 million. That's uh, due to a decrease in assessed value uh, in the pilot, excuse me, the pilot payment uh, for IBM of $131,000. This is the last year of that pilot payment for IBM, so they'll be negotiating, they negotiating a new pilot, or they could be back on the tax roll 
uh, next year. So that'll be something to, to take a look at. So you're saying that's for the 2023-24? Right. 24-25, sorry. 22-23 is here. 23-24. 24-25, okay. Yeah, 23. Um, so we'll find out that information. We'll, we'll talk to them, see if there's another pilot or they get back on the assessed role. If there's another pilot, likely it would be a decrease in the pilot uh, going forward. Back on the assessed role, we could see that increase in growth factor, um, like we spoke about with Swiss a couple years ago. So that's something to just keep in mind, and I'll, I'll definitely keep you up to date on that. In terms of exemptions with the formula, there's a couple things that are exempt. So if you have debt service, um, any capital improvements you make on a year-to-year -year basis, any vehicles you purchase, that's exempt from the formula. Okay. So you take your total that you, this is, this is what we spent this year, $4.4 million, and any aid you receive, any building aid, any state aid, you subtract that, and that gives you an exemption amount. Okay, so that's subtracted. There's another exemption, uh, that which we haven't had in a while. It's based on retirement costs. If the retirement costs increased over 2% for the teacher's retirement, employment retirement, that difference, you can take that as an exemption as well. Hasn't happened in three or four years, um, and that's not gonna happen this year either. So this is the 2% is where everybody has a 2% tax uh, cap. Uh, this is, this is uh, based on CPI. The current year CPI is actually 4.7%, so a very large CPI this year. Um, the max that you can do is 2%. So it's either 2% it's, it's or less of the uh, total CPI. As you can see, uh, based on the formula since 1516, there's been a couple of years where it's been over 2%, um, but again, the maximum allowable is 2%. Um, Growth. All right. And then finally, this is, well, not finally, this is the tax level limit. This is what we present to the, to the Comptroller's office in March, um, but this does not include the exemptions. So, exemptions for next year uh, projected about $4.4 .4 million. This includes our debt service payment for next year, the bus purchases uh, in, ter in terms of the replacement plan for our buses and our capital uh, projects, meaning our improvement plan that we have on a year-to-year -year basis, as Jen spoke about. Uh, I estimate the aid to be about $63,000. Um, the, the final state aid run, although the budget was presented by the governor today, didn't come out yet, um, but I estimate it's gonna be around that area. Um, so that's where we should be in terms of exemptions. Good news in terms of the, the teacher's retirement, employee's retirement. Uh, the employee's retirement decreased to 11.6, so it was a, a minus 4.6% uh, decrease uh, for, for employee's retirement. Um, and a small increase in, in the teacher's retirement as well. Uh, 0.2, uh, it's between 10 and 10 and a half from 9.8. So, so they gave a range now and then they're eventually yep. going to go. So every year they give a range and towards the end of the year they lock it down to a to an amount. It's usually somewhere in the middle of between the range. Um, so again, those don't count for the exemption. It has to be over 2% of an increase. So our maximum allowable tax levy uh, is $86.6 million. That's a 2.54% increase. A little over $2.1 million. Um, just keep in mind, this is the calculated maximum allowable tax levy. It's not what we're going to be presenting to the public. Um, this is kind of the first step in the budget process. Uh, finance advisory and the board will we'll talk about the, uh, the tax cap and where we want to be. We'll take a look at how it affect our, our four towns, uh, and we'll make a decision in the budget process towards the end of where we're going to be for our proposed tax levy. And again, this is the maximum that we could raise. Speaking of that, in terms of since the tax levy was, was enacted, uh, the district has never gone over the maximum allowable tax levy. In fact, uh, has always been below. So if you take a look, this column here is the maximum allowable tax levy. This is what we, the district has proposed going forward. Um, and you can see a significant amount of savings in terms of what was not taxed to the public. Uh, we made reductions in that tax levy based on just what the district needed on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, almost, almost $4 million. Amazing. Again, in terms of the calendar, um, March 8th is our next meeting. We'll be uh, presenting our administrator's proposed budget, and then we'll hear from uh, special ed, uh, technology, art, music, and curriculum on the 22nd, athletics, operations and management, transportation, and we'll talk about revenue on March 29th. Our final budget uh, proposal, excuse me, hearing will be on April 5th. We'll be adopting the budget on the 19th. Um, and then we're reviewing our proposed budget on May 3rd, and the budget vote will be May 17th uh, over at HCC from 6.30 to 9 p.m. If you, any of the public has any questions, feel free to uh, give me an email related to the budget. Please feel free to email me. Uh, this information will be on the website. Um, and I look forward to any questions that the public may have or the board may have tonight.
one quick question, Kelly. Is there any update on just the federal money and the process by which we figure out when we're getting what? FEMA? The, the, yes. Or, or the, the, the COVID federal? Yep. So I've, I've applied for all that, and uh, it's been, most of it's been approved. I'm still waiting on the, uh, uh, the ARP has been approved. I haven't seen the funds yet. Uh, that's the one that's going to be paying for some, some work for, with Tim and our, our finishing our HVAC units here at the high school. Um, so I'm still waiting on that. It's been approved. I'm just waiting for the funds. Yeah. So it could be this year, even before. I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah, I'm hoping this year, based on the way the budget uh, for the uh, for the state has has gone. I'm assuming that'll be paid out likely before the end of the school year. Um, but we'll see. And then FEMA have submitted all the applications. Uh, they've been accepted, so they're in the review process. Um, and I'm hoping that comes fairly soon. I wouldn't count on it this year. Likely next year, or maybe even the year after. Got it. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. So I think we move on now to our principal's curriculum budget exactly. overview, right? Yep. Sounds so good. we have three of our four principals here tonight, but Kelly is going to sit in as Kim Lapple <laughs> and, <I'm gonna> uh, <laughs> and share uh, Kim's part of the report. We knew that she was not going to be here. Um, so tonight, just looking at all of the components that a principal has to take into consideration when they do their budget, budget whether it's curriculum, revisions and overview, instructional strategies, whether you're using different types of assessments, the technology that might help uh, work on that, help you with that instruction design frameworks, um, the STEAM curriculum and how that is being manifest in each of the different grade levels. And then straight up to specific programs like at the high school with Global Scholars or um, the entrepreneurship program, um, which is going to be starting up starting up <laughs> next year. Um, but we're recognizing that all of this also means that principals have to look at high levels of teaching, um, high level of learning for the students involved as well. So we ask our principals to come tonight to just talk to us about their budgets and what you think has influenced your budget this year and what your focus is going to be as a principal controlling that budget. So we have Karen Eldon who has been fantastic as our interim and still is interim <laughs> principal of Coleman Hill. Um, although she's not going to stay with us forever because she was retired when we pulled her back. <laughs> uh, but we'll start with Karen at Coleman Hill and then Peggy will talk about Wampus, uh, Kelly Kim will talk about <laughs> Crittenden, and then Chris, the high school. So welcome, Karen. Thank you. So uh, first, on behalf of the um, Coleman Hill faculty and staff, I just want to thank all of you for your ongoing support. I know your time and your dedication to this is greatly appreciated. Um, I also just want to take this opportunity, like I like to take every opportunity to thank Jen and Tim and uh, Kelly and Gina for their ongoing support and guidance for me um, uh, this year, but more specifically in terms of this budget process. So thank you always. So I haven't been part of uh, Byram Hills District for very long, but it didn't take me long to see and hear the deep-seated commitment uh, to kids first. In each and every decision, there's a resounding theme focused on how is this best for kids, how does this benefit kids, and how can we make this work for kids, which was one of the challenges I think faced most recently with um, the COVID challenges. So no matter what the challenge, that's the one thing I remember. I will remember about Byron Hills. And one thing that is actually um, really near and dear to my heart. So tonight I'm here to talk about the 22-23 budget for Coleman Hill and its needs. As I see it, it seems to be pretty straightforward. We're looking to continue to implement the Wonders English Language Arts program, K through second grade. Um, we also plan to continue the I Ready, or hope to continue the I Ready learning for reading and math, which increases, I mean, I'm sorry, which creates personal learning pathways for each student. Um, 
We also would like to continue with the math investigations program, which makes math really come to life for our young, youngest students. Um, they explore, they get to explore different ways to express numbers and different um, expressions in math. So in, purchase, in looking at purchasing materials for next year, we're exploring the possibilities of shifting the way uh, students are using materials and go back to pre-COVID times. During COVID, we needed to take a look at individual material, individual materials for each student for safety concerns. Uh, this was true as we planned for teaching math investigations where uh, the lessons are really focused on math manipulatives and um, making computations and calculating numbers and written expressions with actual objects. Um, presently, we're looking at reallocating supplies in general to return to a pre-COVID um, ordering practice. Um, one other focus for next year is to continue to enhance and integrate our social emotional learning um, initiatives into our culture and everyday teaching experiences. This year, through the work of our social emo emotional learning committee, we made a concerted effort to elevate our character education work define and show examples of key words like respect, empathy, honesty, and responsibility, just to name a few. As a school community, we value this work and look forward to continuing to grow it at Coleman Hill. Um, with Tim's permission, I just wanted to share a quote that he used um, at our last week's principal coffee. Uh, which really resonated with me as I was thinking about this part of our uh, work at Coleman Hill. And that is um, a quote by Mark Brackett, which is the three most important aspects of learning, attention, focus, and memory, are all controlled by our emotions, not by cognition. And I think that we really do believe that that's an integral part of uh, students' success at Coleman Hill. So as far as our enrollment next year, it looks like we may need to add a section to our second grade class if the enrollment uh, coming in kindergarten um, still warrants nine sections of kindergarten. Um, we, have, we currently have nine sections of first grade and we anticipate that that will move up to second grade where currently we just have eight sections. Um, in addition, we're looking at adding a special education class to meet the needs of some of our students in school um, better than they're being met currently in a um, co-teach model. I do want to add that um, there is an, also an effort towards bringing back our maker um, space work, uh, which was kind of suspended during the uh, pandemic but we're really looking to revive it next year and uh, make it come alive for our students. So in closing, our budget to budget increase is approximately 8%, which is really due to the increase of our student enrollment for next year. Thank you. So I'll just pick so up from where Karen left off. Um, really, I can't thank you enough for keeping our children in school and allowing them to succeed in learning during this unprecedented time. As I stated last year, I like to frame um, my role as principal uh, through a pyramid. Obviously, the first layer being all things operational, the second layer being all things curriculum, the third layer being focused on our social emotional development, and with the top layer just being the growth of the whole child. But this story for me really begins five years ago when I worked at district office with Jen and Tim, and I had responsibilities on the K-5 curriculum and human resources. During that time, I worked closely with them in trying to understand what really needed to be done at WAPIS. And we took an approach to interview over 70 teachers and listen to them and ask them what is really needed for our children at WAPIS. Well, that time at district office, that unique perspective that I gained from working on the curriculum there with Tim and Jen, coupled with my experience 
um, as an operational leader over at Coleman Hill, I understood that the only way for me really to improve and make change at WAPIS was to immerse myself in the day-to-day -day operation at WAPIS. And so with your support and Jen's support, you appointed me back to WAPIS. And that role I devoted to, to our children every single day that I was there. My goal when I became principal at WAPIS was really to foster happy and confident children who saw themselves as capable of reaching their fullest potential. I created an action plan focused on operations, curriculum, social emotional growth, while supporting our teachers for the development of the whole child, every single child. And here's the story of where the historical data was, and I'm gonna take you to where it is today. When I began, approximately 20% of students qualified for special education services. When I began, 20%, another 20% of children qualified for academic intervention services. Two out of every five children were being pulled out from their classroom to re receive some type of remedial support, not from their classroom teacher, from another teacher. New York State assessments were lower than what we would expect. For example, one year, 40% of our third graders did not reach proficiency on the ELA state assessment. And last, but most importantly to the budget, Wampus was operating on a six-day schedule. The impact this had on, on student learning created a decrease. The, the impact this schedule had on student learning created a decrease in direct instruction in reading, writing, and math. And the teachers reported that the schedule was so complicated for our children, it was causing an increase in stress and anxiety. So let's fast forward to today. We went into the, Mr. Mack and I went into Wampus really studying those data points. Wampus students being classified with a special education disability today is down by almost 40%. Wow. Today, our data tells us that one in 10 children are, are being classified compared to one in five. Our academic supports have been reduced by over 70%. Previously, one out of every five children were, being, were qualifying for a remedial support. Today, less than one out of every 10 are qualifying for it. A small example of that is in 2021, our New York State assessment data showed us that 91% of third graders reached the proficiency level. But most importantly, from a budgetary standpoint, the WAPIS master schedule changed. During my time at district office, I spent hours trying to understand the minutes, the contractual minutes of our teachers and how we could build a master schedule that was a perfect fit for seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds. After time spending studying that how to make this schedule, I was happy to present this to the faculty in June of 2018, prior to my beginning my principalship there. And what that WAMPIS master schedule, now that it's five days, has done is, it's allowed us collectively, we have an aligned schedule to Coleman Hill, it's allowed us to reduce four FTEs in the last four years, which is a major savings to the district. It also has maximized our instructional time for our teachers, allowing them the time and the space that they need to make improvements to curriculum and instruction. But more importantly than anything, the change has created a calm and predictable routine for our children, allowing them the time and space they need to learn, to grow, and to thrive. Under the leadership of Jen and all of your support, these bold actions have made Wampus what it looks like and feels like today. But from a budgetary standpoint, the cost of our spending at Wampus has dramatically reduced, yet student performance has improved exponentially. Next year, the student population at Wampus is increasing, but the per pupil expenditure is still the same. The Wampus budget is increasing by 4% to reflect the increase in student enrollment. This rise in enrollment is a credit to all of you because you opened up the elementary schools during the pandemic which enabled our children to thrive in spite of what was happening all around us. And so many people are moving to Armagh because of you. Most of all, during the past four years, our Wampus teachers have been given the tools necessary to impact learning for our children. I have reduced the number of consultants and initiatives by listening to the instructional needs of our teachers. As you can see and probably feel, I'm very proud of the accomplishments of Wampus in the last four years. My principalship, supported by all of you, has allowed our children at Wampus to reach and to see their fullest potential, which is why we all are here. 
As I embark on the next chapter of my career as the leader at Coleman Hill, I will continue to look at these data points so children under my care will achieve their fullest potential and they will also feel happy in doing it. I'm certain the district resources will continue to be allocated in the most efficient way possible. And again, I just can't thank you for all of your support you've given me in the last four years to do this work. It's really amazing when you listen to the statistical difference between yeah. you know, a number of years ago and today. It's not that long a time to make such dramatic change. So, boy, thanks for all your work. Amazing. Thank you. I think Kelly's going. Uh, Kelly, 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 Kelly Kim. Kim. Kelly Kim is <laughs> on. <laughs> Place me with Kim. Thank you. Uh, Kim, I'd like to thank you. You, know, you never want the business officer to do your budget. <laughs> 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 that's, 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 never mind. Actually, you yeah. never want to look at your budget. We do. You never want me to look at your budget. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I changed the numbers. <laughs> so, Kim, I'd like to thank you for providing the opportunity to share the HCC budget with you tonight. Uh, this year, uh, she's prevented, presenting a modest increase of 2.7% commensurate with the uh, increase in student enrollment. Our, uh, her budget is developed to advance the curricular priorities of the district uh, and HCC. With this budget, she seeks student-driven opportunities so to support both the academic growth and the social-emotional awareness of our students. This coming year, uh, the budget supports the academic growth of our children by ensuring that we employ robust resources that align with and promote the curricular goals of our disciplines. <coughs> This includes investi investing in digital courseware, uh, including electronic textbooks and resources, such as Gizmo and Nearpod, assessment tools such as iReady, and hands-on supplies for student engagement. This coming year, the budget will continue to work uh, for our faculty and will support the social emotional awareness of our students. Uh, she will, will remain steadfast to our multifaceted approach based on our work with Challenge Success. Uh, we will bring in area experts for student-directed learning time to support healthy options for our students. More specifically, students will continue to be able to participate in yoga, knitting, mindfulness, and even meet with uh, the nutritionist, continue to meet with the nutritionist. Uh, we will build on this year's work to increase mental health awareness. Our health teachers will once again partner with the JCK Foundation and then utilize student voice circles to process what students have learned through discussions. We will introduce infinity groups through the work of our guidance department. Affinity groups brings students together <clears throat> over commonalities and foster student interactions outside their friend group. They will continue to enhance XPOD to provide each student with a small community for support. There are a few aspects of the budget she'd like to highlight tonight. Uh, her budget will support our focus on student wellness. Uh, funding will allow the advancement of the recognition, recognition program, which celebrates the success of our students in areas of rigor, active learning, risk-taking, and kindness. A specific example of this would be when students are in the sixth grade, they're given journals so they can reflect, reflect on their experiences, moralize their accomplishments, and honor all their work over the course of their three years at the middle school. Uh, she will pro also provide students with keepsakes when they are recognized for their actions. For the December Parent Teacher Conference Day this year, uh, they worked with the art department who wanted to provide students uh, ability to engage in mindful art activities, which is their wellness goal. The budget will continue to allow for our teams, both discipline and grade level teams, to pursue their student wellness goals. Kim also sits in plans that with the chairs and directors during the budget preparation to support curriculum and instructional strategies that align with New York State learning standards. Uh, she will continue to support and include professional development as well as resources. Examples of what this will look like would be continual implementation of the new math curriculum and pathways, which utilize a consultant to guide their work, resources to implement their work, and which includes planning and meeting time. Another example is the continued refinement of the integrated co-teach co -teach models of special education. We'll partner with a, with a consultant, Dr. Friend, to ensure that teachers develop this enhanced methodology. This year, we will continue to study, prepare for, and implement New York State science learning standards, as well as New York State social, study, social studies framework. 
Finally, this budget will allow HCC to expand our interdisciplinary work at HCC. We have budding opportunities to expand our interdisciplinary partnerships. There are professional development opportunities within organizations who can stretch our thinking in both project-based learning and interdisciplinary expenses, experiences for our students. More specifically, a team from HCC, which includes Dwayne Smith and Andrew Taylor, is working and learning from a, from a nationally recognized school, uh, High Tech High. In our January faculty meeting, Dwayne and Andrew introduced this work to the entire faculty. This budget supports teachers to work together as they develop interdisciplinary project-based experiences. We, also, we already are doing high quality work, but this will challenge us to elevate our work to the next level. Kim would like to thank you for your support. <laughs> this budget would invest in our students and ensure they have the opportunity to be challenged, supported, and happy. Thank you. Well done, Kim. In Kim's absence, though, I'd like to say I love how she gets a middle school child. Mm -hmm. Right? It's about ownership of what you're doing, it's about reflection about what you're doing, about buy-in to what you're doing, and sort of, you know, self-expression and, and self-congratulatory um, pieces about the work that you do. You know, just, that is that age group. It's an age group I worked with for 14 years mm -hmm. before going into high school, and it's what you can hope to gain from kids who go through that teen experience, which we know is not always easy for teens, right? But I like how specifically she talks about how she's going to help support teachers in that. It's great. Thank you, Kim Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chris. All right, well, once again, thank you all for your support, uh, continuing to support the uh, great programs at the high school and all we do. Uh, thanks to Kim, uh, to Kelly, Tim, uh, Ken, and Gina as well for all the support. It's hard to believe this is my sixth uh, budget that I'm going to be proposing uh, as the high school principal. And as I continue to grow in the role, what I've realized is it's uh, really a collaborative process. Um, looking at the way that we look at the budget, it aligns with the way that we are looking at our course offerings. Uh, incredibly collaborative with all of the chairs and directors and I find it that uh, it's one of those things that helps me to understand the the ins and outs of what we are doing and how we can make it better so I do go into it with the mindset of uh, looking at how do we promote the development of our Byron Hills High School students to become self-actualized so that's my starting point. And we know that it's aspirational, but we also know that uh, as we work towards that, great things will start to come, come about. So our enrollment next year is gonna actually decrease by uh, nine students. They're all nine panini eaters, so <laughs> happy that uh, we'll have a little bit less of a line. So uh, reducing uh, you know, our student body by 1.23% um, doesn't seem to be that much. It's only nine, you know, nine students is not really uh, a section. Uh, but we are able to uh, reduce our budget this year at the high school by 6%, uh, which is a total of uh, $28,310. Now, over the course of the last two years, that uh, amounts to a little bit over 9% uh, from where we were at our high. And that really reflects our uh, enrollment and it reflects some of the more interdisciplinary offerings that we have in the way that we're able to combine certain uh, programs. So as I said, it is an incredibly collaborative process and I do meet with all of the chairs to go over uh, what's needed within their department and how it fits um, into that umbrella of looking at supporting kids to become self-actualized. We also look at it with making sure that we are going to ensure that all of our ninth graders have the same, if not more, opportunities than our graduating seniors. Now, with a little bit of a decreasing enrollment, that can be a challenge in some of those programs that we want to continue moving, but maybe don't have uh, enough enrollment. And those are difficult decisions that we have to make and look at whether we are going to uh, offer a, a course or not. 
we want to, uh, we have been since I've been principal, strengthened our interdisciplinary course offerings. Uh, we see that with combinations between English and social studies, English and fine arts. We see that within our robotics program, certainly within our global scholars program. Uh, many of the uh, offerings that we have are interdisciplinary in nature at this point. And that really speaks to more of what the world is requiring of our kids when they graduate and leave us. We always think about the soft skills and the development of those soft skills in any of the programs that we're offering and asking ourselves, will this have an opportunity to develop those skills in our students? Uh, one of the great things that we look at with our science research program, the accolades are great, the competitions are great, the research is great, but if you speak to the people who've been through it, they talk about the soft skills that they develop in there. The ability to call somebody on the phone, the ability to compose an email, the ability to present. Those are things that you might not find in the curriculum, but you will find them in the programs. Uh, looking at our work with Challenge Success, just as they did in, uh, in the middle school, looking at how do we find ways to make the experience here more authentic, to build those critical thinking, problem solving, and metacognitive capacities uh, at every, uh, every type of content area. Those are things that we have, uh, we look at in our discussions. We also want to make sure that all of our learners are, are being um, are being supported. So from our students who are uh, looking at uh, very extremely competitive schools to our students who are uh, looking at uh, career opportunities after graduating, we want to make sure that what we're offering um, has the ability to be accessed by all of our learners. One of the things that we're, I am most proud of is the opportunities of student leadership development that we have. So supporting our programs of mentor, peer leader, and our chem TA and computer science TA programs. In addition, we look at our flexible support program, our language and communication program, science research program, global scholars, the new startup program, uh, of course, core academic areas when new textbooks are required or new ways to access the curriculum through online services, we look at that. Of course, our special education and our co-teaching uh, model that uh, has been widely used and expanded here at the high school, that drives much of what we're doing as well. Um, of course, we look up and we see art and the music uh, so prominently displayed and how proud we are of it here at Byron Mills. And we want to make sure that we continue to offer those programs that can help all of those students excel in that regard. Health and physical aid education continue to uh, be uh, promoted in new and different ways. And we look to even expand some of the uh, uh, elective opportunities in those areas. And then finally, making sure that after the pandemic we can support our students uh, to come back and to enjoy the entire culture of Byram Hills through our extracurricular clubs and activities. So this budget supports all of those things and all of the work that our uh, great faculty and staff do here every day. So again, um, looking to uh, the overall reduction of uh, a little over 6% this year, but still guaranteeing that we are gonna be able to support those incoming ninth graders the way that we did to our graduating seniors. Thank you, Chris. Any questions for any of our principals? Thank you all so much. Just outstanding. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thanks for having me. Appreciate everything you're doing this year. Yeah. And I think on that note, we can let we them should let them home. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Except Thank you so much. I'm going to stay. I'm going to stick around. Yes. <laughs> See who's hiding uh, behind that screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We'll do 11.9. Sure. Okay, so we can yeah. do that. And then we'll go to Paul. That's fine. Chris is going to stay. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Tim Kelly. Tim Kelly. Congratulations, Peggy. Good to see you. Congratulations, Peggy. Okay, so we are going to skip to 11.1 .1, textbook adoption and under new business, and then we'll go back to policy just after, after that. Great. Okay, let me um, just wait for Christina Wilson to join. We have Christina Wilson and Deb Kay joining us virtually. Um, and I just need to unmute for a moment so you can hear me. Um, hello, can you hear me, Deb? I have her on mute. Okay. Oh, Christina. Oh. Hello, there she is. Hi. It's an actual case. <laughs> we can hear you, yes. I'm going to turn okay, it great. Thank you. Like that. Oh, that's great. Hi, Christina. Hi. Okay. And I'm going to do this. Christina's on the okay. All right. Christina's on the okay. Oh, Christina, let's see. Christina, are you muted? Oh, we can hear you. Okay. So we're just getting started. Um, so thanks. We'll, um, we'll address you in a moment. So we're first we're going to do the startup program. Okay. So Thank you. let me uh, share my screen. Just so they can see this and you can see this here. So, um, so for this part of the presentation, um, there's three parts to it. First, I want to talk about a, um, a new program that we're excited to launch next year. Um, and then also um, a textbook adoption, which is a curriculum adoption for this program, which I'll need your approval on. And then we'll talk about a few other course changes at the high school. And for that third part, we'll have, Chris will certainly jump in and join us with Christina Wilson and Deb Kay, involving some questions around the science courses. Perfect. So we want them here so we can have that discussion. Um, so first, we're very excited to present um, this new course called Startup. Now, Chris talked a lot about getting kids to self-actualize, which I think if you're at this level and you're ready to start your own business in high school, you might quite, you might sort of be there a little bit. Um, Chris also talked about the focus on programs around the learning dispositions and what it takes to learn at high levels of, of academic challenge and rigor. He talked about the need for leadership and continuing to promote leadership. And he also talked about the work through challenge success. And we believe this new course will meet those criteria. Uh, we've been talking about uh, this type of um, program around entrepreneurship for a few years. Been in discussions with Chris about it at the high school, and Andrew Taylor has been involved in researching and developing this program as well. And we actually have a startup committee that's working on um, the curriculum and implementing this for next year. So I want to go through some of the details and then happy to answer any questions about this program. So it is going to be a two-year program which would start during the junior year. Um, although you don't have to take two years like Global Scholars, if you're ready to take the first year when you're a senior, that's okay as well. We didn't want to have that type restriction um, to make the requirement both years. Um, we believe that this program um, aligns with students who are We've got a lot of feedback from students through conversations that Chris has with his principal advisory around opportunities like this. I think this will be one of the most interdisciplinary courses that we would offer, and I'll, we'll take a look at some of those um, feeder courses in a moment that will lead to a lot of disciplines in the connection. And the curriculum that um, the textbook adoption form is attached in your packet for your approval is a program called um, Incubator. Um, and that is from this organization called Uncharted Learning. We vetted a lot of different curriculum and thought of just doing our own as well. We think this is a good base. They have a really strong foundation and that program works with us to implement this and helps us throughout the various components. And it's a fairly complex curriculum, so you'll see that as I go through some of the materials. So we're sort of glad to have a partner organization helping us implement this. Year one will really be about learning about businesses and the curriculum around business. And I'll show you that curriculum in a moment. And the goal is giving kids real entrepreneurship experience as they think about and develop their own idea to launch their own business. So they will be looking at models and learning about different business models and interacting with a lot of entrepreneurs so that they can help gain their own skills in that area. The second year of the course would be actually launching that business and managing that business. 
And we believe this can draw upon a lot of different areas from the, the computer science courses and technical courses like uh, the robotics course or the pathways in engineering. We also believe this can pull upon students in the arts from a graphic design to filmmaking as well as in the humanities like global scholars and the investments in marketing class. Now these feeder courses aren't necessarily pre required prerequisites. Um, they're just areas where we will eventually bring some of the curriculum down to these courses because we think it'll it makes sense to embed some of this in those courses to gain interest for students and some exposure to entrepreneurship ideas while they're in sophomore uh, uh, ninth grade or tenth grade years. Is there any prerequisites, Tim? Or not? not right now, no. So any kid, if you're an 11th grade kid, can join the course. And if there's no application process, it's like Global Scholars. If you have the interest to learn this, we welcome everybody to the course. So just you'll create as many sections as you need, more or less? We believe so if we have the staffing for it. So that's what we're wondering about. Um, registration's happening this week. So at the end of the week, we'll get a sense of what enrollment's looking like, the at least the, in the interest in it. So we will try to run as many sections as we can. We think this might pull from some of the other, like investments in marketing, we think it might take some of those kids, and we actually have three sections of that course. That's a really popular course, so it might free up some faculty in that area. Am I speaking okay on that, Chris? Is that right? Yeah, we just don't, it's one of those things where there is excitement around it, and we know that I think we're going to get a lot of requests on it, and we just have to have our counselors work with the students to fit what's best for them. So there, there's a lot of conversations going on, but uh, I think there, it's going to be, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of requests for it. Right. So there are sort of three domains of learning. There is the content skills and knowledge around running a business that kids will learn. There's also the mindset of being an entrepreneur, and that's very different than just working for someone else. And then there's the behaviors. What are the actions you need to take to be a successful entrepreneurship? And those are all, all three of those domains are explicitly taught throughout the course. And the content includes everything from uh, learning about your customers and how to meet the needs of your customers and connecting with them, to the finances of running a business, to building up your minimum viable product and how to sell that product and get funding for the product, um, how to experiment, how to promote your business idea. These are all aspects that students will learn in that first year curriculum. An exciting piece for me, and Andrew Taylor and I have been wanting to do this for a long time, is get community members and parents involved in our coursework somehow. And this uh, has three opportunities to involve our families. One is we are looking for experts to be coaches. Any of you have any expertise can join our database. Andrew and I have a survey and we're collecting names. And we have over a dozen uh, people so far. Um, a coach would be someone who has an expertise in some area that is in our curriculum on those topics I just showed you, like maybe you are an expert in financing and can show kids how to do financial modeling. Maybe you've set up um, LLCs and you're a lawyer and can help talk to students about how to do that. So you would work with the teacher, come in and teach a lesson to the kids and share your own experience as an entrepreneur or in your field of expertise. Another area is to be a team mentor. So once teams are formulated and starting to put together their business idea, you would meet with them on a regular basis to give feedback to maybe um, anticipate some some obstacles they might encounter and help them overcome those obstacles and how to maybe answer some questions they have and give them some advice along the way. And then a third way is an advisory board that would be um, a, a group that hears the pitches that kids make. They do two pitches in that first year. One is their initial pitch and then at the end of the year. And those pitches would be, it's sort of if you think Shark Tank, that's sort of like that group that is um, giving the advice to the teams that are presenting their ideas. So that, those are the three different ways that we get experts and community members involved in this, and it's a really exciting part of the program. So we're in the process now of collecting and building up our database. Um, as you're looking at the curriculum and deciding to approve that this evening, it is aligned to a lot of different types of standards and it's tightly aligned in, throughout it through various uh, business standards, through um, standards in 21st century learning, to career and technical area standards. So it has a strong alignment to standards as well. Um, this was uh, an example of a um, 
a unit that is on financial modeling. So kids learn various different financial models. They have to predict that this company is going to make money or lose money, and then how they might um, address that issue. And again, if you were an expert in this area, you could come in and maybe even show your own financial modeling that you've done with kids. We think that's a really great opportunity for learning for our kids to really connect with parents and family members and other business leaders in our own community. So that is our entrepreneurship course called Startup. We had a different name initially, so you might have heard a different name, and our promotional video has a different name. We floated it by kids, and they didn't like the name. They were like, we don't understand what that course means. What was it originally? Venture One. Venture One. That's right. Yeah. They thought it sounded like a credit card. Yeah. 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 You had said that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we brought it to some kids. We did a couple small focus groups, and we floated Startup, and they said, that's really cool. So somebody recommended that, and we're like, okay. And they got what that course is. So I think the marketing is really easy on Startup. <laughs> and so we changed the thing. Why not? Um, so before we move on to the next phase, I just want to see if there's questions on this program or any questions on the textbook um, approval the program. A, a quick question with the community involvement. It's, yeah. it's, it sounds a, a, a little bit like a, a Herculean effort just to like get different um, people in for all the different types of you know yeah. interests that kids might have. So what what is the process for that? So I know you're collecting. Is it are they? Is it all uh, voluntary positions? Are they yeah. vetted? Are they uh, uh, it's given stipends. I mean, depending, I'm just curious about. Yeah. So first of all, it's voluntary. Okay. Um, Andrew and I are taking the lead on that to build our initial database. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about it at every parent meeting that we go to. So we started with our education foundation, uh, who uh, I would like to thank for donating some of the initial startup money for mm -hmm. this program. Yeah. And um, we have a survey that we send out, which lists sort of the areas of from the curriculum if you have expertise in these areas. And you can either sign up to be a coach, a mentor, or on the advisory board, or if you're not sure, just want to volunteer, you can just sign up as well. Then we're gonna do training sessions with the volunteers. Cool. So that we bring them together and actually create a little community amongst the volunteers. That's so nice. That might be neat for them to meet each other. And we train them on the different areas. If you're a coach, this is the work that'll be. If you're a mentor, this is the work that'll be. So Andrew and I are gonna do that in the first year just to help build up that first initial uh, group of, of experts to come. That's in. wonderful. The Thank company you. we're working with, our, our the the, um, the publishers of this curriculum recommend that you have about 20 people mm -hmm. initially. So we have over a dozen so far signed up, and I haven't we haven't really started full force on our community yet. We plan to do that in the months to come. That's so we can go into the summer and do some training sessions. And we also think there's a pool in our senior internship mm -hmm. uh, uh, locations mm -hmm. so that we can work with them as well. That's very good. Yeah. And we'll reach out to alumni as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this will be a great thing for alumni. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be hard the first year, and then hopefully you get a group of people, and then they continue yeah. for multiple exactly. years. It gets easier. Yeah. yeah. And it's helping our students to network with the alumni. That's part of it as well. That could really Yep. Help them move yep. So we're excited so, about that. Special thanks to the BAGF. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we want to thank that. Thanks. So, was there any thought to making startup a three year program, kind of like science research and global scholars for maybe that student or those students who those aren't the proper pathways yeah. to give a sophomore an option to start yeah. something like this earlier? Was that. Yeah. In the works. Yeah, we had a long conversation about making it a two or three year. It seems the curriculum that just seems fitted for two years in terms of learning about it and then launching your business in the second year. Certainly, you can fit in a third year. It would make we could probably figure out to do that. But also, we didn't really want it to compete with science research and global scholars in that first year, um, and that's why we were identifying these feeder courses. So, if you are interested in this, we think over time we can start. Um, intentionally bringing some of that content from the first year into those feeder courses so kids could connect with that work as a sophomore if they're interested and see that this is something they're interested in and even get a leg up on it. And then we also have a club after school as well that kids could be involved in. So we think there's other ways to get younger kids involved earlier um, if they are interested in learning this before they start with the official coursework in the junior year. Makes sense. That was our thinking Great. around it. Thank you. Yeah, and we're open to you know exploring that once we get started and see how this goes. Okay. That was our initial thing. But club's interesting for those that just don't have the time to schedule. Right? Yeah. I'm sure there'll be even more demand than will allow just given the scheduling complexity. Exactly right. Yeah, we didn't want kids to think it's a choice between the three: yeah. local scholars, yeah. uh, science research, or this, because we think we're a small school that, that we thought that would really. 
um, limit some students who maybe could fit in both. Maybe they do Global Scholars in, in the first two years and then do startup in the, their yeah. senior year or something and, and have some flexibility in that way. Okay, and then it's, before I go on to the next book, do you want to address the curriculum and maybe vote on the um, yep. the incubator curriculum that sure. support this program? And then we can go to the other courses. Sounds good. So I make a motion to adopt the uh, textbook incubator EDU, right? That's what it is? Yes. EDU. Yep. Second. All in favor? Okay. And we thank you very much. Tim and Andrew, excited. we thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great work, Chris. Yes, thanks for your work. It's very exciting. exciting. See how it okay, thanks. Um, then I'm going to go over a few <laughs> other. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it's going to work out. It will. Yeah, we're excited. Um, so a couple other new additional courses at the high school. Uh, first, I'll talk about English 12 Humanities Seminar uh, Literature and Ethics. So you'll know, uh, recall that over the past several years, we've been making some changes to our English 12 program. So we have... Um, Students are required to take four English uh, credits, so they take English 9, 10, 11, and 12. And they're just sort of put into those Englishes without any choices. And there's a few electives in there and some advanced courses. Well, um, Dwayne Smith has been working with Chris to develop some options for students in their senior year. So is there a way to sort of, again, go to students giving some choice in their senior year for English electives and adding some exciting courses. So over the past years, you've approved um, and we've talked, we've introduced uh, podcasting we did last year, uh, the art of uh, multimedia narrative, and um, also multimedia journalism were two courses that we've introduced as electives for students to take as an English credit their senior year. By the time you get to senior year, you're deciding, I just want to take a general survey course of English again, or do I want to take something that's a little more niche and something that I'm interested in and maybe fits to my area of um, comfort and expertise. So um, they've been successful so far, so we're continuing to build on it. We're excited to introduce this literature and ethics course. And you can see the, uh, the, the, the description here, and that there will be lots of good study, diverse uh, perspectives, and really looking at ethics through the lens of these, studying these different literature. I think that's a really interesting um, course that will attract a lot of students. Does it replace an existing course, or is it just, just an English, English 12 elective? So no, it just would be less sections of English 12, and just adding this section. Yeah. So but it will fulfill the 12th grade requirement yes. for English. Yep. Yeah, and it fits the 12th grade requirement for English, exactly. So we're excited for that course. Another course we've been planning for several years is AP Environmental Science. This course, um, we have AP courses, advanced placement courses in biology, we have it in chemistry, we have it in physics, but we never had an advanced placement course in the earth sciences. And so it was a course we've been thinking about and working on over the last couple of years, and now seemed like a good time to introduce this. There's a readiness for this. So this will be another AP course for students who might be interested in sort of the topics of geology, biology, environmental studies, and more of the earth science range than in the chemistry or biology or physics. So it's adding another AP course to our science program. What year would that be available to students to? If you buy most to seniors or also juniors and seniors, Chris? Yeah, well, it's going to be, if you look at it the way that you would look at an AP Bio, AP Chem, or, um, you know, AP Physics C is really the only one that would be seniors getting in there. Um, but they could take it after they complete chemistry, they could take environmental science. So after chemistry? Yeah. Okay. So they'd already have earth science, bio, and chemistry, and chemistry right. before they have the science. And then they can start taking the science selectives like mm -hmm. these courses. And another change we're making is reinstating Physics A and eliminating AP Physics 1. Um, several reasons were uh, um, led us to that decision. So um, when we started AP Physics 1, it was a similar type of course with similar content to Physics A. During the pandemic, the College Board eliminated some key content to that course. And then they just announced at the beginning of this year that they weren't going to reintroduce that. So AP Physics 1 has become a course that took out some major topics. And it was no longer going to be a prerequisite for our AP Physics C course. 
So we were sort of faced with this dilemma. They were taking a course and sort of reducing what the, the level of rigor of the course. We felt that wasn't a good program for our kids. So we wanted to bring back Physics A, which we had, this was about five years ago, we made that swap. And bring back Physics A so we can keep it at that type of rigorous course and make Physics A a prerequisite for AP Physics C. Otherwise, you would need to take, if we kept the, the AP curriculum, you would need to take AP Physics 1, AP Physics 2, and then would be prerequisites for AP Physics C. And we're not According really to what the College Board expectations exactly. are. Exactly, so the College Board So it curriculum. used to be you could just take AP Physics 1, and then you could take exactly. C. Exactly. But right. now you need 1 and 2. To be prerequisites. So is we, Physics A an AP class? It's not an AP course, but it's an advanced course, like an well, like advanced okay. course, um, like Pre-Calculus A or Bio A. Those courses. So it's an advanced level course. We're going to bring that content in that does make it a prerequisite for AP Physics C to have our kids be ready for AP Physics C, which is an important course for students who are going out to engineering schools. AP Physics C is something we want to keep offering as a great advanced level physics course. Um, Tim, if, um, if AP Physics 1 has like, come down in rigor a bit or doesn't mm -hmm. cover as many topics, was there a way to? Keep AP, AP Physics one, but beef it up with call it like non-AP content to prepare those students who want to go on to C. Or is it like not overlapping? Like, is there is there just too much content in AP Physics one to add anything else into it, even though it's not the right prereq for C? That that is, I think I understand what you're saying. So, in other words, just make it AP Physics one, add our own content to it, right, and then do that. I think that can be challenging with AP courses because the, of the defined curriculum. There's other content in it that you have to cover. Um, and then if we have to add in this additional content on top of that, I, I don't know if that's doable or not. And Deb, I don't know if you have a thought on that question. Did you hear what Scott asked? I did. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for being flexible and letting me uh, come in from a distance. So we weighed all the pros and cons, and we didn't think that um, you know trying to you know, beef up or fill in the, the gaps of where the AP eliminated some of the real core concepts and topics that we value would be a worthwhile endeavor. And um, it, it kind of goes against, you know, the whole need of having a solid physics course. And, and I think like it's almost like if we have our bio A or chem A, this is our solid um, in depth and breadth physics program and for example if I could just um, speak to the topics that um, we would have to try to supplement um, currently the AP exam prepares students for just the AP1 exam and um, it just it prepares the students for the AP physics C mechanics portion so for us to supplement it like Dr. Kaltenegger said before we would have to try to almost teach another like the AP Physics 2 program and there's not enough um, time in a school year to do that. So um, we opted to go back to the Physics A program which was a really solid program before and it um, offers students a, a great foundation in physics and that allows them to get the prerequisites that they would need if they wanted to go on to AP Physics C Mechanics and Electricity and Magnetism because the AP Physics C program is actually two courses within a course and there's two exams. So I don't know that I answered that. So Deb, if I'm understanding you then, our, our Physics A course that we designed is sort of, let's just call it the greatest hits of AP 1 and AP 2 that gets the prerequisites for the AP Physics C, um, Magnetism and Electricity. And mechanics. Yes, and it also um, teaches all of the important topics that we value and believe should exist in a really solid high school um, advanced physics program, whereas AP Physics 1 didn't. It was very barren. And just to keep it for the name did not seem um, logical with all the other things that we wanted to do. So, for example, um, Physics A prepares the students for not only an AP physics exam, they can take the exam, any students can audit it in AP, um, but they also can take 
Um, we also are teaching a lot of topics in the AP Physics 2 curriculum, which not all of them, but we are um, covering topics like thermodynamics, electric force fields, and electric circuits, magnetism and electromagnetic induction, and um, optics. So we are not covering quantum, atomic, and nuclear physics, which is um, in AP Physics 2. So, okay. Thank you. Um, I think that's helpful. Um, and Christina, can I ask you just to speak to how colleges understand our programs um, during admissions and the, speaking to the Physics A course and how they know the level of rigor of that course? Um, yeah, um, so well, first of all, I mean, I think, I hope everybody knows that a description of all of our courses is on a profile which accompanies every student's um, application to colleges. So they certainly would understand uh, that progression. And I think that really what they're looking for is the rigor of, of the course and the topics that are taught in a particular course, um, you know, more so than, you know, whether it's an AP or not. Um, I don't know if there's something more specific you wanted from me, Tim, on that. I just wanted to get your general I thoughts think on that. if we have an AP course and the kids don't take it, it's different than we don't have the AP course and they're taking a physics A course, right? That's the distinction. Right. I guess one specific question, Christina, is, or did, you go first. Yeah, is, is if, because um, for somebody that's going on in the progression to AP Physics C, if they're more interested in the engineering world, then ultimately they're going to take an AP course that, you know, that sort of cap, it's the capstone of that experience. Mm -hmm. If someone is not a particularly interested science student, then it's sort of a moot point. They can take physics, they don't have to take physics, but at the end of the day, like they have the choice. And certainly there are tons of APs that we have. They can <laughs> take as many APs as they want. Exactly. I guess there's, there's exactly. a student in the middle that I just, I, I would pose a question about in the world in which we live, which unfortunately, in a weird way, like the college is making SATs and ACTs optional. I think, although I'm definitely not an expert, has put more pressure in a way on the AP exams, making them maybe more important than they even were a few years ago, just because it's like one of the only metrics to level set students district to district or private school to public school or whatever you know, the case may be. So I guess for the science student, like the, the, whether it's the pre-med student or just the interested science student that wants to you know, take a rigorous science load but may not go to C, especially if they're doing science research and they don't have time in their schedule, is it a problem that they have only one AP in science? Because just thinking it through, because you, you sort of have to take physics, bio, and chem. Have to is a strong word, but you're encouraged to if you're, if you're sort of on that pre-med track. So if you're going to take physics, chemistry and bio, I think the way I'm thinking about it is that you'd only have one slot to take the AP. You could take AP bio or AP chem, but it'd be very hard to take both if you're, take, if you're doing science research. So for that group of kids, like, do you think it's putting them at a disadvantage or do you think that with the description and the, uh, you know, that you put out and the conversations that you have, you think it's, it's negligible? I don't, I don't see it as a problem because I think I think the colleges are really looking holistically at our students and it really wouldn't come down to one specific AP course. If our student can really, you know, is competitive at a competitive school, they have um, the rigor in a lot of our other areas, including, I think, Physics A and um, AP, AP Physics C, which certainly a number of our students will do. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to come down to being an issue of one more AP. I think they're going to have those that opportunity in a in a bunch of different areas. Just and mind, we also offer uh, physics regions and conceptual yeah. physics as well. Yeah. So there there's a, you know a full range. We offer four levels of physics. Um, so to Christina's point, they're going to look at what is most rigorous of our offerings. If a student is going to take that physics A, what the course description is going to say is that it goes beyond the AP Physics 1 curriculum and colleges are going to see that and they're going to make their decision off of that. You know, I think anybody who's going into it, right, knowing, um, knowing that we are really interested in ma maximizing our kids' chances at getting into really those competitive schools, for us, we really debated back and forth about this because we knew 
that there's a certain, it, it's not very popular to pull back on an AP course here. Um, some kids will just look at it as a numbers game. I need to have six, I need to have seven, I need to have eight, I need to have nine. And we certainly knew that that played into this. But AP offer, also offers capstone, AP capstone or AP research. And in my mind, there's no way that we would say that that AP, we would rather get that AP research than our own authentic science research program. So those are really the tough decisions that we have to make and that we really feel at times that we can do it better than the AP, uh, AP can. And you know, knowing that we were pulling that back, we knew that we had to get this right and we knew that it could not hurt our kids' chances when they do go out to apply to colleges. That in no way would it, would it make them look you know, any less prepared than kids who were taking that AP Physics one elsewhere. Just to, to dovetail off, oh sorry, Do I have to speak? Go on, Larry. Oh, just to dip, sort of dovetail off of what Scott said, I'm, you know, um, I'm just curious too about, I, I totally understand what you're saying about the curriculum and um, uh, the physics A being more substantial for the, the child that's going on for engineering to take be able to take physics C. But, you know, I, I'm just not, I'm not really understanding in my mind, it, it just feels like it's a disservice to the child that's looking to go for um, traditional biology, science, pre-med, all those other types of courses when we offer Chem A, AP Chem, Bio A, AP Bio, and now we're not offering that child an AP course in, in chemistry. Okay. So I just... In physics. Yeah. And I'm sorry. In physics. So that, that's just the concern. And it's sort of like um, you can get the AP physics, but you had to already take this other course. And why is it possible to still offer AP physics and the physics A and explain that if you're going to go on for engineering, this is the right route you would take, but also, also offer AP physics to the... Mm -hmm to the student that will need that, you know, for certain, um, you know, certain colleges and certain, uh, I don't know. So yeah, and, and I think our, what I will add is that we um, offered Physics A about six years ago prior to offering AP Physics 1 because the college board didn't even offer AP Physics 1 and AP Physics 2. Their, their um, physics program was aligned differently. and. Um, we had a physics A program and it was a homegrown similar to what we are, you know, working with now and our students never had any issues getting into the best colleges and I think that that's the data point to keep in mind that, you know, um, we had this structure in the past and so we do have um, an AP physics C, so we have a a physics and an AP physics and if we didn't offer this physics A program our students wouldn't be prepared for that AP physics C um, because they wouldn't have the prerequisite information that they needed for those two AP exams and so for students that want to go into pre-med or things like that what we recommend is they after chem A they can either take physics A as a junior and then AP biology as a senior or any of the other AEPs, and that's another reason why we opted to add an AP in the geosciences, which we really hadn't had in the past, because we felt that that was balanced, and it would give more kids opportunities to pursue areas of interest in an AP that we never offered before. Is it possible for a student who takes Physics A to then sit for the AP exam? Some people take psychology and we don't sure. offer or, or some so if you're teaching the curriculum through a through physics a will the school offer ap physics one will that be a consideration if you're covering the topic anyway the students can take the exam that's one of the things that we said that um when we analyzed the curriculum and did sort of like a, a curriculum map of the, the scope and sequence we realized that students could with our physics a program they could totally sit successfully because we are covering 100% of the AP1 curriculum. Why can't and a call it AP8? AP okay. So some kids AP might even want to supplement the AP2 and sit for two AP exams. So um, that is an option. Okay, thanks. That Chris, so, you're so it actually takes the pressure off of a student who, is a, who doesn't want to take the AP 
it actually helps a student that who's not interested in the AK because it's not a requirement. However, our students, it will be offered at the school for them? Yeah, we would do that. The, the only difference is what the transcript actually says. So the transcript will still have physics A on there, but they will show an AP Physics score mm -hmm. for that uh, AP Physics one. As long as it's other, yeah. Now, if you're, if you're a senior, if you're a senior who's taken that uh, Physics A course and you're sitting for the exam, that'll be listed on the, on the uh, course uh, description that students have the option of sitting for the AP. But it will not. It will not show on the transcript that it is an AP course. Right. But it will also say in the description from the guidance department that we don't offer AP. Correct. Or to. Correct. That if they sit for it, they're doing it to go above and beyond what we offer. Correct. I think that it's helpful if at least students that want to, because it's their choice, have the option to sit for it because if it maps pretty well. Because my my original concern when I heard this was not that we're losing an AP course because I agree that sometimes people get lost in the AP arms race and that ultimately we want to do what's right by students and learning and if there's a non-AP course that we think is better, so be it. And there are plenty of great schools in this country that don't use the APs at all or they use them sparingly. Right. I, I totally get it. The thing that I guess was a little bit concerning was it's physics. And rightly or wrongly, and we can argue you know all day long, but there are a lot of schools that seem to still want biochemistry, physics, and you can take environmental science and somebody might be interested in that, there's nothing wrong with it, but it may not replace for certain schools like that requirement. So that, that was like when I heard the original concern, but if, if you can ultimately sit for the exam, that really you know, reduces the... Uh, yeah, look, I think that would be interesting to see whether it did have any impact, whether the student took that and then reported the score you know, on their on their acceptances, it would have to be regular decision, I guess, at that point. Actually, it might be too. No, but they, they can do it as a junior. As a junior. To they, see they if, they it, to. if right. it had any uh, any impact. But even if you're taking AP regular AP physics as a senior, you still, your score wouldn't be yeah. there till. APC. Right, but you no, would list AP. it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you had APC and you were applying to some of those right. competitive right. schools, you would show it on your. Yeah, yeah. But it would show that you're taking right. an AP rigorous course, and you would have your grades throughout. Right, you would show that physics A grade, and then if you sat for the exam, that would be posted as well. I just would, I guess, uh, curious to know, and I don't know if we have this data. Other schools nearby are they offering AP? physics and AP physics C or or physics A like is it because you know our, our kids do compete with the other kids for spots in college I'm just, just curious about that is it something that's I'm just not sure how they're gonna have enough time to take AP physics 1 AP physics 2 yeah. and then C no and, and what we would see is that um, it would be one thing if this was uh, like a calc AB versus right. a calc B, BC calc but the AP Physics 1 and the AP Physics 2, that would require two full years, where the AB is going to be one year that we do it. Right. So in, terms of the, in terms of what the other schools are going to have to offer to be competitive is that AP Physics C. Right. Um, the, in terms of offering the Physics 1 or the Physics 2, I, I really I don't, I don't have that data. Uh, I can reach out to, you know, my colleagues. But Chris, I don't even know how they would do it. You'd have to take physics one as a summer. You'd have to take it over the summer. You'd have to take it uh, over the summer of your uh, junior year. Because the college board has changed everything, so now you require those two. Okay. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. So I think if we can add, so Chris, you're saying we can add the in the course description that students have the option of sitting for the AP Physics one or two course in our physics A course description, that might help. Sitting for the exam. Sitting, Sitting for, for the exam. exam. That's an option for that course. We put that in our description and that's part of our profile. That then shows the level of rigor of this course to the colleges. Yeah. And that I'm finding might be helpful yeah. to our that's students. Great. I just want to make sure that Christina is. I, I, don't think, I don't know if you have to make that decision today. I, would, I, would, I want you guys to We'll, we'll talk about yeah, that. I, I just want to, to summarize the terms. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I don't want we will, we will. We will agree I felt more that. comfortable knowing it. But and Christina's smiling, so I want to say <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to put words in it. I'm loving this conversation. <laughs> I just want to figure it out. Um, I, I, think, I think it's kind of the best of both worlds, and I love that it shows initiative on the part of a student who really wants to take it to that level, but it's not in any way harming our student 
who decides that they don't want to sit for that eight day. So um, I think that's somewhat of an easy fix if we could offer that and include it in our description. That'd be great. We will debrief that as well and yeah. just make sure, but that seems like it seems agreeable to everyone. Thank uh, you. We used to have uh, students take uh, macroeconomics, just taking their economics and they used to sit for it. So. Right. It's, it's, great. Uh, it's not I don't know if anyone remembers the SAT twos when um, you know uh, yeah. we would prepare the kids in bio A for SAT two and in the late spring when the kids most of them would take the SAT two they they wouldn't be finished with the curriculum and they would have to do some supplementation. That's right. yes. I think it's a similar model from what I'm hearing everybody say is that the AP one and the AP physics two it, it those two things are in tandem and if a student only takes the AP physics one course it's, it's not a, a bad thing but it's almost not going to give them the full um the full course experience because the assumption from what i've heard and from what i've um you know learned from other schools in the science um meetings the department chair meetings when we discussed it is that you know colleges um they don't really just want to see AP Physics 1. They want to see, now that it's even more barren, they want to see AP Physics 1 AP, and AP Physics 2 if that's what we're going to offer. Otherwise, that's why we went the Physics A route. That's great. It's that's great. It's helpful. really helpful. Yeah. Thank and you we'll so see. much. The College Board makes a lot of changes, and I wouldn't doubt that they might be changing the sequence because this is probably the conversation happening across sure. all the schools. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll um, talk about that more, Chris and Christina and Deb, and we'll certainly make sure this is okay with the teachers teaching the course and all of that. So uh, we'll, we'll work on that. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you all so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, thank you Christina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. All right. Did it change this year, Tim, or is, is it next year there's like another change? Yeah, I think it was. It um, changed, and then they're, they're not changing back. You know, changes. I see. So it changed already. It's not changing again, but just they're not changing back to what it was. Yeah. Right. That was decided last year during the pandemic that they changed the curriculum and then they kept it throughout this year. And they said we're including it. Ah, I see. That was a pandemic response and then they just, for whatever reason, and I'm not sure of the rationale. Do you know? I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't know how schools can really do it without physics. taking three years of a kid's I never science took uh, to do it right. <laughs> right. You know, maybe they're doing it over the course of the I never took any of these things. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you for seeing us. Thank you. 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 Not having to take these SAT students. Oh, the SAT students are a good job. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of time back in students' so, Yeah. Except for my one son who enjoyed studying for those. Oh, <laughs> God. There's always one person. There. There's always the one. other. The There's other always one. Who ruins it for the rest of us? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Wow. I have a whole new understanding of all physics. Do we have to vote on anything else? Yeah, that or not? With that, no. Did we do the textbooks? We did all that. We did the textbooks. Okay. Yeah. We have that? more stuff to vote on, but first we're going to have to vote. Yeah. Okay. We haven't approved the uh, textbook yet. Okay. I'll come back to you for that one later. That's nice. Policy? Is that what it's called? Policy 10.1. Oh, okay. we can take it. All right, Tim. Okay. We haven't spoken to you <laughs> So I think we have a few uh, portions um, that refers to this policy. There's the second reads, which is the, okay, the textbook selection and adoption policy, library and resource material selection, uh, public comment at board meetings, and agenda preparation and dissemination. So we have this for a first read in December. This is a second read for these. And I don't know if there were, we had a few questions maybe at the last meeting. I don't know if there's any more questions on this policy. I think I, I read it again, I think I have a better appreciation, but just the, under the textbook one, right, what gets approved versus what right. doesn't. It's right. always like a little bit of a gray area given that these days there aren't too many textbooks left. Right. <laughs> this is um, 4511. Yep. Yeah, but I mean, I see the way it's worded. Right, so it's books that are required for students. So curriculum are books that students are required to have access to as opposed to maybe like 
Let's say, for example, summer reading. We don't have you approving all the summer reading. That is optional work. That is not something that we're making a student sit through. But say our Algebra 1 curriculum, all students have to sit through our Algebra 1 curriculum, and therefore that requires board approval. Or, or even a, a novel in a 10th grade class, right? Like right. if you're having an anthology and this is something that's going to be part of the curriculum, but novels are going to be changing up again. So things that all students are required to to learn from, like a textbook that all students will have access to, then it requires the board approval. It's and that's not a to sign up for our curriculum. Yeah, mm -hmm. refresh. I only yeah. was the, yeah. that's confusion it does. sometimes as to what we weigh in on and what the state weighs yeah. in on. And I'm actually attending a webinar on that. And I think we saw that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's in this webinar. Yeah, so yeah, I think this question is coming up. So uh, I think some one? recent changes and regulations have added some confusion to it. Yeah, so it's, it's really confusing. Um, I will learn. And but if there's any changes we can yeah, yeah, I, I signed up. Yeah. Yeah. We're all going to be on. Okay. Yeah, I signed up for it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's soon. Yeah. Yeah. So we may have to come back and change these anyway. Yeah, exactly. If we learn something. And then for first read, we have two parts here. First, um, there's the professional learning policy, which uh, was updated a few years ago, but then there were some changes to regulation, and so those changes reflect the changes in regulation, which is including administrators in this. It's also changing the name to professional learning as opposed to professional development, and um, a few other small, subtle changes in that policy, nothing major. I don't think any I'm missing the attachment. Under 6.11? So is that what you signed in? I, oh, let me try again. I signed it. The, um, the library and resource materials selection one? Yes. Where it says that there's a procedure if someone you know, has an issue. It's like a procedure that you follow. Like, yeah. Where is that procedure mm -hmm. laid out? Is, you know, is, that, is it within a policy or is it set? Is it not part of a policy? Well, I guess it's, is it 1420? Is it that where you the complaints? Oh, it's 1420. Yes, 1420 that's what it is. That's what it is. Sure. Okay. Right. And we just worked on that earlier this year, though. Got that was this year or last year. As a mechanism. Yep. Yep, there's a mechanism and there's a whole uh, regulation and process we follow for complaints and a review process. The superintendent of folks at committee um, that oversees this. Did you need a motion for the second week? Um, mm -hmm. We can do it all at once. We could do it all at once. And then there's one more part, which is looking at a first read on policy 0000, which is educational philosophy and mission statement. So this is one that um, we're going to turn over to the policy committee board members to lead a discussion on this. We felt as the administrators, um, we didn't feel it was our place to um, revise or edit your educational philosophy. So we thought it would be great if Petri, Mia, and Lara led a discussion around this policy and certainly we can then come back to the policy committee um, which means tomorrow morning at 8 30 as a reminder um, and we can start having conversations if there's any edits and, and we can also start that conversation tomorrow if the board would prefer and bring this back for the next yeah. time yeah. Yes. reading the room yes no, that's fine. So okay. we can take that off of the first read. We'll take it off of the first read? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> All right. All right. So, Scott, we would be doing the second read on those four and then a first right. so read on just 97. To do second read on 4511, 4513, 1230, 2342, and then a first read on 0000 and um, 9700. A second. second. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. So, uh, before you go too far, yes. I don't know if it's, if it's you or Jen, but for 11.2, this is approved, this is uh, acceptance of a PHEF grant for executive functioning for ninth and 10th graders oh, great. at the high oh, school, yeah. which is awesome. That is so nice. Yeah, it's a $4,000 grant, which we appreciate. So nice, yeah. yeah. Um, and and I just have to say that, you know, when I think about the beginning of COVID and that a year or two years ago, the BHEF was literally walking with me around school buildings mm -hmm. to try to see where they could support the district by putting outdoor learning spaces. 
right? And and not missing a beat in executive functioning at the high school. Um, I give a lot of credit to this grant to Kira Hunt, uh, who did a lot of work with Chris Walsh um, in just identifying what kids need, particularly this ninth grade group, and just having the flexibility to work on executive functioning skills, meet with somebody who's an expert in the field, have workshop experiences with them is amazing. And I think they're even opening it up to some interested 10th grade uh, kids as well. So just really targeting that group. And we know that that group of freshmen, um, their seventh and eighth grade experiences were very altered, mm -hmm. right? So they are not coming in as freshmen um, like kids did two years prior. So. Um, it is important to address that. So I want to thank the BHEF for that. And you know, if you look at two of the major things happening tonight between startup and this executive functional workshop for kids, um, all this during a pandemic is pretty miraculous. So just thank you for that. And I guess you will have to accept. Yes, yeah, so a motion, motion to uh, accept with gratitude the BHEF grant. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. You're so lucky to have the BHEF. Oh my god. Yep. It's awesome. We go to, uh, oh, this is fun. The this calendar. The calendar. <laughs> All right. I just it first it's, here for, it's here for a first read tonight. We don't anticipate the changes, right, Gina? But one never knows. Right, so this is our 22-23 uh, proposed calendar in its draft form. Uh, it presents again 183 days for our students and 187 for our faculty. At the time and even up till today, I checked again today, the region schedule for 2023, both January and June, those exam schedules are not yet out nor is the rating day. So we are we have tentative dates here based on this year's calendar and previous calendars where we think they'll fall. But of course we once we've received those dates, if there's any changes that we need to make, we'll bring that back. Hopefully we'll have it before the next meeting. Uh, in terms of the superintendent's conference days, so something unique about this uh, calendar this year, we will be, uh, we're proposing to have all four superintendents conference days prior to the start of school. The start of school uh, for our students would be September 6th, which is the day after Labor Day. And the reason for this is because, you know, in New York we're not uh, able to start school until September 1st. And in order to get any of those other superintendents conference days at some point throughout the year, we would have to bring our students back either September 1st and or September 1st and 2nd, which we know is difficult for a lot of our families to do that prior to Labor Day. Um, so again, if, any, if anything uh, changes with the region schedules, obviously we can take another look at that. Um, additionally, all of the required holidays that fall on weekdays are honored in the calendar. And sometimes when that happens, where every holiday falls on a weekday, that takes up another day. So um, we are proposing to fulfill the superintendent's conference days per the BHVA contract, but prior to the start of the school year. We also have Juneteenth as an additional day in there, yeah. which would have been a superintendent right. conference day somewhere. Somewhere. And we have it this year as well. Yeah, correct. Right. One week mm -hmm. holiday in December. Mm. Right? A week, week, or a week and a day. <laughs> Yeah, it's a week and a day. Yeah, one day. You get January 2nd. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. I think uh, if this stays the way it is, parents will be happy to start after Labor Day. I know, I know that they've been um, kind to us when we've had to do that, but I know that it's not ideal. Yeah. Okay. And we don't have to vote on this, do we? Or do we? It's a first read. First read. Yes. Yes. So you do. Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. So motion to approve the first read, but only first read. So don't put your yeah. non <laughs> plan as motion to put it. Yeah. So moved. I get the, the second. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> yeah. I get the emails tomorrow starting. Can you tell me what the calendar I, is? Yeah. Can I tell Mario? Mario. 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 Yeah. I want to plan a button next <laughs> Yeah. That's right. All right, so next we go to 11.4. So there's, um, as we know, a seat open for NISPA Area 10 and uh, for a directorship to represent our area, uh, given that the current person in the seat became president of NISBA. There were three candidates that applied, and um, Westchester Project School Boards was uh, kind enough to send us um, videos from each candidate and bios. 
Um, we looked at that, um, and the good news is there were three very viable, incredible candidates with lots of board experience. After reading through all that, there were two candidates um, that um, that stood out and also happened to have relationships with us district I mean, with somebody in the district um, in terms of just work we've done regionally with um, with different advocacy organizations and school boards and that was Frank Harriton and um, Cheryl Brady and so we decided to uh, just have a subset of us um, run just uh, a little mini process where we met each candidate and got the chance to ask them questions and I think unequivocally there are two great candidates and we'd be very fortunate if either one of them represent our region. I think on the margin from the process that um, that we ran, um, that um, Cheryl Brady um, is recommended to the board to um, for us to vote, and because we get one vote as a district to the business. so I would make a motion um, to uh, uh, for Cheryl Brady. So moved. A second. 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 All in favor. All right. That's uh, that's his very attempt. Why don't we go on to 11.5? So um, this is so so per the December meeting. Um, just to explain what we're doing on 11.5, Ira um, had you know announced that he was going to need to step down given that he's become the town judge, and then um, he provided us um, a resignation um, that would take effect on January 1st. Um, but this is our accepted, or I should say, December 31st was his last day. So this is the acceptance of his resignation. Um, uh, for his board seat. So we just have to actually take action on that and get a motion to accept his resignation. And so moved. Second? Second the board. All, right. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? All right. And All curiosity, what would have happened if we didn't um, accept the resignation? It's a good question. <laughs> he couldn't be the judge of Northcastle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. And if anyone is watching tonight but did not watch in December, we all said very nice things That's about right. Ira and celebrated him on that night. So I encourage you to go back and look at that. And it's nice that we have video. Now that we yes. We yeah. have that as well. Absolutely. I want to thank Ira for his tremendous service. Tremendous. Eight times board president, 23 years on the board. Amazing. Absolutely. So with that, that transitions to 11.6, which is to have a discussion on um, Ira's board seat. And I think just we, we briefly spoke about this in December, but just to kind of recap different options um, that we have as a board for Ira's seat. So one option is to leave the seat. Well, first of all, let me take a step back. No matter what we do as a board, no matter what we decide, in May, when there's an election, the, that seat is up for election. So no matter what we do, it doesn't change that process. And the process by which that seat will you know, get put forth to the public to vote on, it doesn't impact, what, it, there's no impact on any of what we're going to discuss now on that process. That process will proceed no matter what. The question is, between now and the election, what do we do with our receipts? That's really the only question we're addressing. The public will have the normal course opportunity to um, you know, decide who's in that seat in the May election. Between now and then, there are three options. Um, option one is to appoint someone, which the board has the power to do, um, as long as we think there's a person in the community um, that, that can serve competently, that, that is one option. And that appointment would take place as soon as we made the decision on who to appoint, and then it would carry through to the election. The second uh, option is to leave the seat vacant until the election, and then the third is to run a special election. But just the caveat with the special election is it is a full election process process from the standpoint of the process that we have to follow and so it would mean a full day at the middle school um, it would mean all the expenses that we normally would have for the election and there's a notice period so likely would take place Close to the mail. Very close very to the mail. Right. It starts to encroach on the mail. So, and it's so, a burden on the taxpayers and a yeah. burden on the, on the schools. Yeah. Right. People and bringing people into the schools. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, the discussion for tonight that we should have now is, you know, is what kind of road do we want to follow? Do we want you know, uh, to embark on a process to explore the possibility of appointing or you know leave or leave the seat vacant and, and you know at least for now. So that that's I think the, the question at hand to debate. Anybody has any thoughts to give it all? I think we should um, at least in, embark on the process of seeing what if they if we have candidates who are interested in filling the seat until the May election. Um, 
you know, with, uh, as you as you said, the seat will go up for election by the public at that point. But it's, it's certainly, I think I think we should open it up. So I agree with Mia. Should we talk about what that process would look like if we are going to open it up for interested candidates and, and what that would look like as far as timing leading up to the May 17th election? Yeah, so if we if we want to embark on a process to explore uh, appointment, then what we can do, and I'm just, our next board meeting is February 8th. Does that sound right to you? Yes. So, um, you know, probably a reasonable thing to do would be to say, today's January 18th, that uh, we would ask if anybody has interest in the seat, uh, in the public, in the community, um, that w they would notify us of that interest, you know, between, call it now and January 28th to pick a date that's sort of like uh, just about almost not quite two weeks out. It's about a you know week and a half plus out. So it'd be not this Friday, but the following Friday. And um, so if anybody has any interest in that seat, you know, what we could do is we could have them email us just a statement of interest to the board. And then I would say to Kelly as well, uh, Kelly Cyber at the district. And that way we have a district copy and the, and the board email. And then on the 28th, depending on whether we have you know, interest in that seat, then we can figure out um, sort of the rest of the process from there. And we would, of course, notify all candidates that came forward of the rest of the process. We could have, um, you know, we could send out uh, questionnaires with, with questions to ask, which would be a reasonable thing to do. Um, we could have, um, you know, we, 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 there are a number of things that we could do just from a process standpoint to just evaluate candidates. But, but I think the first step is to figure out whether do we have, you know, folks that are interested, and if so, just giving them a chance to come forward. Which also email address should they use? So they should use, um, make sure I don't give the wrong one, is it board of ed at byronhills.net? And then, Kelly, you just want to give your email address as well. Yep. It's K Cyber, S E I B E R T, at byronhills.org or net. And just so anyone sure. who applies understands, the board only speaks to the president, so there won't be a response from, there won't be a discussion throughout this email. We'll just receive the email. Yeah, we're saying that we'll acknowledge. We'll just make sure that either just Kelly or myself, one of the two of us, acknowledge that we received it just so there's no ambiguity. So if you do send an email and you don't get a response from one of the two of us, then absolutely follow up with us either by phone or feel free to send another email. But basically, you know, we, we could certainly um, you know, take any interest between now and January 28th. And then, as I said, then, um, you know, certainly, um, at that point, can, you know, could decide if we do have interest, uh, just how to further evaluate candidates to come ultimately to a decision, which, uh, you know, which, which hopefully, you know, we would do as soon as we as soon as we can. Um, I think that on the Board of Education tab on the website, we can put a link there to Board of Education at contact how to contact, how the, to board, contact the board, how to contact Kelly. Makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Just make it easy. Do we have to take a vote now on whether as a board we want to explore the appointment process and see if there's interested candidates? I think we should. I, I don't know if technically there's a requirement. I think we should best practice. And then ultimately, if there are candidates, just so the public understands the process too. So even though we're a board of six right now instead of seven, any decision, whether it's to appoint a board member or if we're approving the budget, still needs four votes to pass. So the only way that a seat would get filled is if there are four votes for the individual. Similarly, anything else we have to, like all the things we voted on tonight, everything takes four votes. And that holds true, you know, for you know, because we're a seven person board, regardless of how many people are on the board or how many people show up to a meeting if somebody can't make it. So that just to just to make that clear as well. But let, why don't we do that if unless anybody has any other comments or questions or thoughts? Okay, so we'll take a motion to at least proceed with the process to explore whether there is interest um, in the seat um, so that we can you know, ultimately decide whether to appoint. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right, so if anybody's interested, again, um, we'll, we'll put the links up on the website, but um, board of ed at byronhills.net or case, case, case cyber at byronhills.net. By January 28th. By January 28th. At, what do we say, by the end of business day, by the end of 5 o'clock, <laughs> yeah. in case anybody's <laughs> deciding until 4.59. I was supposed to do that. Do you want to ask any questions? No, yeah, any questions? Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
All right, sounds good. There you go. That takes us to staff reports. All right, so Tim, uh, <coughs> yep, slide so one, there you go, perfect. Before I start tonight, I just want to talk a little bit about board goals, and I think tonight it's a really appropriate night to talk about them and the progress that the board has been making toward the goals. First goal is excellence in teaching and learning. And we heard from Peggy tonight, uh, from all of our principals really, but Peggy and Karen mostly at the elementary level is supporting this K-5 math program implementation and the study of outcomes for students, um, supporting the study of this K-5 literacy program, the use of progress monitoring tools, real coherence in K-5, and the new standards of science and social studies and how they're going to do that. So I think tonight was a good indicator that the board's goal on that budget is being fulfilled through our principals and through the budgets that they're doing, I mean, on that, on that goal. Um, of other thing of note is social, emotional, and physical health and safety of students and staff. We've been hearing that all year long and following that for the past two years, two and a half years with the implementation of the work that was done with Challenge Success years before that. Um, you heard most of Kim Kelly's report was about the social emotional support of students. We didn't hear it from the elementary principals, but that has been their goal this year um, and something they've been reporting out to us with the new implementation of the program, K-5 finally. Um, Another piece of board goals is health safety of students and staff, and that was really where we were all reviewing these COVID-19 protocols. If you just think about the fact that this year we moved back into school, right? We had classrooms that were in gymnasiums last year. You know, the teachers and everything it took for them to come into those classes, the changes in the schedules that occurred at the middle school and the high school and the training of the teachers that had to go into that, all of this with COVID protocols being a board goal. And now are we going to implement that successfully and make sure that we try our best not to have any in-school transmissions. So the board goals really were supported through weekly meetings that I had as the superintendent with the county executive and all the superintendents in Westchester. And the board has been a support for me being able to do that work and for us to collaborate as a community, which we're not really finding in other communities. So I'm grateful for the board support of that. Our mitigation plans, in, in, you know, when we have, were struck with various variants, um, district community stakeholder partners that the board supported who I met with as late as you know this early December about what our progress is going to be um, and we're going to be needing them less and less as we are slowly but surely getting back to a more normal school experience but I can't uh, undervalue the board's goals of the COVID protocols and the safety and health of staff, I mean, that has absorbed so much board time. Um, and if there's anything that you did constantly, it was that. I mean, there was never a reprieve. It's not like a project you can look at and say, okay, we're looking at social emotional learning and we're adopting this curriculum and now go. The curriculum is going and the board could sort of sit back and wait to hear um, feedback about it. The COVID piece and the health and safety and the social emotional learning of kids is like prevalent every single day of your work. Um, the last part is fiscal accountability and communications and the current year's issues about you know reducing operational costs and um, our long-term outlook of capital projects and we're looking at pensions and we're looking at health insurance. And I have to say, Kelly, for the first time ever as a superintendent, I did not run the budget meeting. <laughs> Good job for you. <laughs> That's great. And that, that comes from all of the work that you've done with the board, with the board having finance advisory committee meetings and audit meetings and getting a real sense of what the budget of the school is and how we're spending our monies. So um, just congratulations to the school board on all of your progress on your goals. Outstanding. And now uh, for the superintendent's report. Demographers report first, a COVID update, an update on board goals I did already, and student highlights. All right, so first, if you take a look at the accuracy, um, we have K to 12, the actual for 21, 22, 
this year was 2322. Um, they were projected 2256. So it's um, you know a difference of I can't see Tim said 66, right? 66 students. So you know pretty close. And given COVID and everything and the number of people that moved into the district, um, I don't I don't know that any demographer could could predict. But I don't, I don't, right I don't think so. Go ahead, Tim. Next, you're going to see uh, this is how it couldn't be predicted. We originally had uh, projected needing 23 sections of kindergarten, um, first and second grade, and we had 26 sections. So we saw a great increase there, and that increase is going to go through. We have nine sections of kindergarten, nine sections of first grade, eight sections of second grade, and then 777 seven, seven for third, fourth, and fifth. So you're starting to see that big bulk of kids going through. Why the budget was so much higher for COVID now? Yes, because yeah, they have more teachers. Yeah. For a few well, also yeah. at Coleman Hill, they're having a new program, a new special education program, which is keeping our kids in district as opposed to sending kids out. And also, um, conversely, we can have kids come into that program to tuition. Yeah. Well, that's great if it's available. And then, so this, I'm going to fly through this a little bit, but look at the home sales. So if you look at, you know, 157 home sales in 2019, there were 192 in 2020. Wow. I mean, you just, that's a big change, number one. So we're filling a lot of, um, flipping, I guess, a lot of houses over. Now, I'm going to go through this quickly. This is approved and proposed housing that is in our school district. This is page one, then there's page two, and then there's page three. There are 188 potential residences, not including the proposed airport campus. <laughs> so um, opportunity for even continued growth, right? We like growth, but we like growth in measure. These are all new, new they're all new. They're, they're all new. They're all how many? Individual homes or multi? Some of them are individual and some of them are in here. No. 188 potential residences. Now, when I say potential, it's because where are they in regard to the town board and where are they in stages of the process? And there are some housing um, projects that are happening in Armagh that have gone back and forth to the planning board like a hundred times. Right. Like they're just not getting built, right? So those are included in there as are um, like the airport campus that I've weighed in on pretty heavily. That's not going to tax us. Right. So um, we're just continuing to grow is the answer. We don't really, we can't really follow that number at any given point given what's happening. Um, we did have a huge influx of people into our community, and I think it speaks well of our schools and our school leaders and what they were able to do, our teachers and our staff. Um, active cases. So I thought I'd give you a little update on where we are right now. Byron Hills, go ahead. So this is from September. So if you look, our total number of cases, total positive has been 238. Those are PCR reported tests to us. Um, we've had 32 district cases requiring quarantine. That's 32 cases requiring quarantine, not 32 quarantines, right? Go ahead, Tim. Thanks. Um, so I started asking myself just since January 3rd, well, what is happening? What percentage of our kids are absent, like because they're sick or whatever reason? They could have not come home from vacation yet. We really don't know the reasons for every absence. And how many kids are on remote instruction? So I just started tracking it. This is a two-week time period. So just take a look at Wampus, for example. So you started at 10%, 47 kids were out on January 3rd, could be vacation. 6% were in quarantine, that's 28. Then you go to 7% in quarantine, then 10% in quarantine by January 6th. And then you come to this week, 7, 8, 8, 4, 4, right? Um, kids in quarantine. So, you know, I'm having a conversation with Dave Mack, and I'm like, great, Dave, so out of the 18 kids who are in quarantine right now, how many were quarantined from school? Zero. Mm -hmm. These are all cases of either a sibling has COVID or they have had an exposure somewhere. Um, so the good news is that the six feet of distance and the three feet in between students in the classes is preventing us from having to do too many quarantines. Um, the realistic news is that COVID is still out there. Um, in our call with George Latimer this morning, they were talking about a great decline in the number of COVID cases right now. And they're very excited and they're starting to see that decline every single day. 
Um, so I'm hoping that these numbers even look more favorable, but they're not very high percentages of kids who are out. And this should catch, that. the last thing you just um, showed should catch rapid tests theoretically too. Right. right. Versus the one before with PCR only. Right, okay. exactly. Yep. And then uh, ending with some great student highlights. Yay! Our Garmendale seniors selected a top scholars in Regeneron Science Talent Search, right? So um, our students, Derek Iraqi Cordilla, Edith Bachman, Sydney Levy, our board president's daughter, <laughs> and Emily Pizzaruso, lovely, are among 300 students who will continue to the next round of the prestigious math and science competition. Um, they were recognized for their independent science research projects conducted over these three years and of all times to be conducting science research, right? Yeah. Um, you couldn't really go anywhere or, or do any of that and they did it despite all of that. I have a link to the news article there too if anybody would like to see it. Congratulations. And Alyssa Margolin. Oops, that's okay. Uh, Westchester Putnam Girls Tennis Player of the Year. That's pretty outstanding, right? To watch her speak about her wonderful accomplishment. You can go on our website and you can hear her speak about it. Great job, Alyssa. And Beth Corelli, Ira was so excited about this. Uh, the Varsity Girls Basketball awarded the Con Edison Scholastic Sports Weekly Award for the week of January 10th. Um, individuals, outstanding achievement inside and outside the classroom and on the field, in her case, on the court. Congratulations, Beth. And what a night. It was the best night. Tim, Gina, and I went to the art show. The HCC and Barn Hill students had their work showcased. Pete Pollux was metering people into the art show. 35 he, at a time. He, 35 people at a time. He was very strict about it. It was fantastic. The art teachers were in the art show, there to greet their students and their parents and talk about their art. Um, I, I have to say that one of my favorite moments, I know a student very well who is in the high school who's, who um, loves art. We've had conversations about art numerous times. And when I went in and I saw her sunflower, I was reading the little like notes that were in the sides of the sunflower and I was like, what an amazing kid. And then I looked at the name and I said, it figures, right? Like I, it was so nice to be able to see the art and connect them to the students. Um, uh, the jewelry and metal smithing class work there was outrageous. Um, a lot of the um, graphic design was, was unbelievable. The photography, Samantha, Will, Mil, uh, Samantha Milowitz, I think it's hard to say that. Um, she had an incredible piece with firefighters. I mean, it, it was absolutely outstanding. It was so enjoyable. We walked out and we said, we're so, we were so glad we went. Like, what a, what a tremendous experience. And I know that the community really appreciated it. So thank you to Pete Pollux and to the art teachers who were there. Um, just, it seemed like a natural, real night, right? Yep, that was great. And safe. And here are some of the pieces that I just, right? They are that amazing. The this art is safe. And look at that on the left. That's from the metal smithing class. It's just outrageous. And look at that hand. Just great. And our senior, Rebecca Fryden, for her performance in New York State Music Association All State Jazz Choir in Rochester earlier this month. Um, it was an amazing concert that she went to. Kyle Banks went, and um, Dana Celestino went. Um, she, um, Kyle Banks said, I was really thrilled for her. She was selected to perform based on her high score on her Nisma and vocal jazz solo in the spring. And we kind of moved mountains to get her to go and we're so glad that we did. Um, she actually came up to me and thanked me and said that she had the most incredible experience of her life. So congrats to you and what an accomplished musician. And that is it. So nice to see our oh, art awesome. program so strong. Oh, I know. So great. And the kids seem so inspired. Thank you, Tim. Good way to, uh, yeah. Yeah. Any other, uh, do you have no additional report for me? <laughs> that I can't do that. Kelly? Kim says no. It's hard to go after that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, any board reports? Just that you, Lara, Tim and I are going to the curriculum. That's right. I guess. Yep. I we, um, Lara and I have a sport. 
town meeting. It was yeah. postponed, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a hard thing to figure out the sports right now. I think something that you're going to be hearing is um, with test to stay. Yeah. If you are an unvaccinated student, you can come in every day and you could do test to stay and go to class if you were exposed. And not in the home, but if you were exposed somewhere else. Um, however, you're not allowed to play extracurriculars. So what is the problem with that? The problem is you have a kid in a theater class, ninth period, who can participate in class with classmates because you pass the COVID test in the morning, but you can't go to your locker and then go back to theater for your after school activity. So students who maybe in some schools, they have jazz band practice before school starts. You're not eligible to do that, even if you took the test and were negative. But first period, you have jazz band. So there are some things that don't quite make sense. You are in PE class, but you can't play sports. So we're having conversations um, just so that they can let us know a little bit more about that. Um, not everything is sports related where you're maybe expressing a lot, you know, in, in the arduous task of sports. Uh, but we have had conversations with um, the county and they're going to have conversations with the state for clarification because they call it an extracurricular activity and the state does not necessarily know extracurricular activities like school does. Extracurricular activity to the state could mean karate which we don't offer, right? It could mean like you go to arm up dance or you go somewhere else and that is considered extracurricular. So we're trying to get feedback on that. But for right now, it's putting athletics and other extracurriculars in a tight spot because we can't really let the kids do it until we know that's what the email is. Okay. Some more to come. Changes every day. Yep, Changes every it really day. does. Any, uh, Me too. <laughs> yeah, we all are. Any communications to report? Okay, so then we go to Board of Ed Minutes, which actually had one very small but uh, change. I said the total, but be there in one second. Uh, well, I'll ask for a motion first, and then I'll motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Okay, so bear with me for one change. Here we go. Oh, here, I'll find it this way. Did you change that Ira is like punking us and he's coming back? <laughs> <laughs> um, it is, I'm sorry, I, should, I had this written down, but it's at home. Ah. Okay, yeah, this is, I mean, just to be accurate, it's <laughs> under the tennis section. He reported that this is the first girls tennis team in Byron Hills history to capture the state championship title on behalf of the board. I think it's, it, should, it should say it's, it's the first girls sports team. And then um, there was another place where I think it said that, ah. Did he say it's the first girls sports team or the first tennis team? Was it a he said? This is, you know, this, this is, is Ira. This is the wait. There was another. There was another oh. section. Hold on. Give me one more second. Otherwise, I'll give up. <laughs> oh, all right. This is it. This is it. it's what I said. This is. I'm not going to change Ira's words. Okay. Yeah, this would be Ira. But you have the chance right now. <laughs> if you want to. To the Byron Hills. He noted that this team's. Okay. He noted this is the team's third championship. However, this is the first championship for the Byron Hills girls varsity tennis team. It should say he noted that it's the district's third championship. However, this is the first championship uh, for the girls uh, tennis team. That's all. It's third not the team's third championship. It's yes. the district's. That's that's what it, that's, that's what I saw. It. That was it. Just that I one word. So, so with that word, all in favor? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, they did make history. So um, that's it. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.